All right, everyone. Hello and welcome. My name is Michael Montgomery, and this is Preparing for Azure Service Fabric, the second part in iDesign's Service Fabric series. Just a little bit about myself. I'm a master architect at iDesign, and in that capacity, I help our clients conceive, design, and build modern microservice-based systems. I've been doing distributed systems for quite a while, uh, I was a former chief software architect, so I have a lot of experience owning systems through the full SDLC, which as an architect I think is vitally important. So I know the challenges with owning microservice-based systems in the wild. And I've been doing microservices for quite some time. I'm also an author, trainer, and speaker, and I've written an interesting article called Escaping Appland that you can Google. and the essence of that article is the crux of the, what the service fabric represents, where that we have reached a point in the industry where we are no longer simply building applications, but systems. Today, we're going to move through the essential aspects of prep preparation. We're also going to clarify why preparing is so important for the service fabric. We're going to then introduce a novel approach to preparation, a framework I design created called Service Model EX Service Fabric. And then I know you guys are all jonesing to see some code. So we're going to spend a significant portion of this session walking through a, a demo example service. We're also going to highlight a simple transfer story between what the Service Model EX Service Fabric provides into the actual fabric. So preparation, how do you actually get ready for something as new and unique a platform as a service fabric? Of course, as you would expect, you need to consider design aspects. Crucial to that, of course, is then how you construct the system, the development aspects. And then, of course, how do you deploy this thing? That's Service Fabric addresses each one of these uniquely. For the purposes of this session, as well as the webcast series in general, we'll be focusing primarily on development so that we can get you guys familiar with the environment as well as what it means to develop for the fabric. And throughout the series, we'll touch briefly on the design and deployment aspects. We won't delve too deeply into either design or deployment because, as you know, those aspects in of themselves require broader treatment. But when appropriate, we'll touch on them briefly. So to that point, design. How do we prepare our designs, our architectures for the fabric? So as you know, preparing for a new platform is really never about the technology. In the case with the service fabric, that's especially true. You really need to consider the fabric's system structure, and you have to ensure that your code base is compatible with that structure. And of course, that means that it's a microservice-based architecture. For most of you, that implies that you have to carve up your monolith. You can't come at it ad hoc, and hopefully you would use some kind of systematic stepwise approach to carving apart your monolith. Of course, ideally, we would suggest you use the iDesign method for system architecture. And briefly, for those of you who aren't familiar with the method, it's a microservice-based architecture approach that contains a microservice taxonomy. That taxonomy is highly compatible with the service fabric's system structure. We also recommend not necessarily decomposing your system solely based on feature, function, or data model, but instead looking at the areas of change within the domain, what we call volatility-based decomposition. For deployment, of course, that means you have to ready DevOps. Now, the cool thing about the fabric is that it represents off-the-shelf DevOps pipeline. So instead of having to cobble together disparate technologies to produce your pipeline, the fabric provides one for you. It also provides all the necessary scripts and examples to link 
your deployment pipeline to your continuous integration build process. There is built-in support for TFS, but it also has pretty rich support for many other um, build tools. It also helps you align your lifecycle policy. So the service fabric, as we discussed in part one, has supports a fairly um, rich SDLC within its automation. So that helps you stay aligned with the service fabric and a, uh, a well-defined life, life cycle. And it supports all the different aspects, as we discussed previously, including uh, some of the ones that most often are forgotten, such as decommissioning services and uh, systems themselves. It also simplifies uh, new concepts, such as elasticity and uh, something really new, the reliable distributed state management. So from a development perspective, and this is what we're going to primarily uh, dwell on today in this session, most difficult aspect of any kind of technology shift like the service fabric represents is the break with legacy code, as well as techniques. Some of the key aspects of the service fabric model are very different from the way you structure your code and you develop uh, today. Now, it's interesting, though, that a lot of the techniques that I design has proposed and recommended throughout the past decade or so are directly in line with the way that the service fabric works. So if you've used those techniques in the past and aligned better with the historical mandate, then your code has a better chance of moving forward. And then the essence of today's session, we're going to look at code that helps you with that transition directly. Now, what we're seeing right now is that lift and shift approaches meaning taking your existing applications, websites, and APIs, and moving them into the fabric uh, are providing little additional value because you're missing the essential benefits that the service fabric represents, particularly the integrated platform and that delivers to both development and operations. Sometimes, depending on the situation with your system, you won't be able to do a lift and shift at all. You either have just completely incompatible system structure or just inefficient programming models. So that's another thing that you must consider. From a development perspective, to seize the capabilities of this new platform, you need to start writing forward compatible code today that allows you to carry your software assets forward into the future. You, what that essentially means is that you need to be able to start preparing your code base for a smooth transition. And it's not only your code base, but it's also your development shop. So they need to get up on the new programming models, as well as, as their maturity grows, get comfortable with the operational aspects of the fabric. Now you need, essentially, you need to do this without a big bang. We know that big bangs don't work. Now some Rarely the opportunity where you would have a greenfield um, situation where you would just be able to start fresh on the fabric. The majority of you have a great deal of value encapsulated in your existing software assets. So you need to find a way to break up that monolith and move it forward. That was the primary motivation behind why I designed created service model EX service fabric. We wanted to be able to allow you, as well as the industry at large, to expedite their prep preparation for the fabric. It's important to note that this fabric is production ready. It's a ready main framework built on top of techniques that we have been using for over a decade that have been deployed into production in hundreds of systems. And it also is interesting to note that since our techniques are very compatible with the architecture and the programming model of the service fabric, we were able to use many of those original and novel techniques and build the fabric um, in a straightforward manner in fairly little amount of time. And so that allows you then to use this 
feel confident in using it and carving up your monolith in place. Service Model EX Service Fabric represents the Service Fabric's programming model in .NET. And what we're going to show in the demo is that this is outside of the Service Fabric, so there's nothing to install and maintain, and it really represents a lightweight and fully testable Service Fabric, one that you can deploy into your existing .NET environments uh, on Windows alone. This helps you uh, attack that systematic stepwise approach in carving up your monolith. Now, there are multiple strategies you can use when you leverage Service Model EX Service Fabric. You can start by targeting .NET and then plan to transfer to the fabric later. Or you can intend to target the Service Fabric, but jumpstart or bootstrap your development shop by starting efficiently in .NET, get them familiar with the programming model, move seamlessly between both the solutions targeting the Azure Service Fabric and in .NET, be able to carve up your monolith in place, and then you can start, as their comfort level and maturity with the fabric matures, then you can start introducing your development shop uh, to the broader concerns of, of the operational aspects of the fabric. And so far, that has been working out very well uh, for uh, early adopter clients. So what we're going to highlight in the demo later today is a simple transfer story. We're going to start in .NET with a simple .NET example, and we'll show an analogous solution that targets the fabric. We're going to show that the code is shared between the two. So this is a really simple way of going between the two environments. And uh, in early examples, uh, I even use this technique, and I've come to really appreciate how easy it is to move between. Then we'll recompile for the actual targeting, the service fabric, and then we'll publish uh, our service into the fabric, and we'll take a look at that as well. Now, the simple transfer story really streamlines the developer experience because it's lightweight and a little more efficient to be uh, doing your de development cycles and, and debugging your code and those kind of things in .NET without having to worry about deploying into the actual fabric uh, every single time. And it's really an interesting option to be able to go back and forth so that you can have this seamless uh, developer experience from .NET into the fabric and back if you need to do um, some quick testing, for example. And what we found so far is that this type of approach, starting out in .NET, but allowing them to get up on the programming model has really eased it, the developer's learning curve. And as we discussed, you can they can then come to the operational aspects as they become more familiar with the ideas surrounding the service fabric. So you can start in .NET. You can actually design the system because the service model EX service fabric adheres to the fabrics system structure, so that aligns your code, allows you to actually structure your code more, rigorous, more rigorously for the fabric. You can develop in .NET and unit test in .NET. You can even deploy this code into your environments if you need to. And then you can continue on in the actual service fabric, deploy, do integration testing, load testing, and then refine. Now, quickly, there's additional value with Service Model EX Service Fabric that we're looking forward to uh, leveraging as well for our clients and uh, hopefully for the industry at large. Since it has such a lightweight footprint, it allows you to bring this Service Fabric programming model beyond the server into uh, other environments like the desktop, tablet, phone, or hopefully in the future even on the devices itself, themselves. Now, when we get into the Service Fabrics programming model specifically, it provides two distinct service models, service model and an actor model. Now, Service Model EX, Service Fabric actually supports both. In this introductory session, we're going to focus on the service model. And specifically, we're going to look at a stateless service. Future sessions will dive deeply into the actor model what an actor represents, 
what its value proposition is, its programming model, and then we'll look at new concepts like actor pipelines, meshes, and graphs. In the Fabrics service model, Microsoft has called this particular model the reliable services. And you use these services for common service types like your API or more simple streamlined services for remoting. Reliable services also provide uh, communications mechanisms uh, that are built on top of WCF. And that allows you to transfer more readily your uh, legacy WCF services. Now, your API services are what you traditionally would think of as your interoperable services. They provide the broad reach. They're accessible beyond the service fabric. And uh, there's details uh, with the operations of these. But basically, when you're in Azure, you, of course, need a gateway. You have to remember that when you're in Azure, your, your cluster itself is not exposed to the outside world. So you need to use additional Azure uh, services to provide that uh, translation between publicly accessible endpoints and your internal services. And you would do the same for on-prem as well. Now you know that the API services are ideal for supporting the multiplicity of clients, meaning that all the varied uh, client platforms that you would need to access your system, uh, these service types are perfect for that. They're also compatible with all the browser-based languages and tooling, as well as the developer capabilities uh, for the devs who work in that layer. Free API services. The Fabric supports ASP.NET Web API, either 4X or 5 for the services, or it also now supports ASP.NET Core. Now, we don't really dwell too much on the API services because aside from hosting, they have the same startup, routing config, controllers, as you use Web API currently. The only difference, of course, is that once you move into the service fabric, everything must be self-hosted. That means no more IIS. And what that signals, as well as ASP.NET 5, is the death of the monolithic server. And this is happening across the industry at large. Uh, the breakdown of these former very large service-based or application-based um, web servers into something that's much more streamlined uh, and lightweight pipeline. And that's exactly what you need to use within the context of the fabric. Now, just briefly for the specifics on the hosting, ASP.NET Web API uh, uses Owen-based, Katana-based uh, hosting, which many of you, I believe, are already familiar with. ASP.NET Core introduces the new hosting model for Kestrel. The Fabric supports both. Again, these are self-hosted web servers, lightweight, and the Fabric manages the host process. Now, what we're going to look at today is the other type of reliable services, remoting services. And they're called remoting because it provides this very simple, straightforward uh, programming model, as you see. And it's the best for compositional or component-based services. And this means that while you have your API or your websites as your forward-facing interaction, remoting services are ideal for acting as back-end clients for your sites, APIs, or even other services within the fabric. It's important to really appreciate the fact that the remoting services programming model is interface based. We know now that that's almost a foundational concept for modern software construction, which makes it so much easier to code, test, fake or mock, and simulate your services. And of course, that simple interface based programming model is compatible with all the back end languages and tools and services and uh, developer capabilities. It also makes it the best for microservices. We, at iDesign, we believe that the API programming model is inappropriate for microservices. It doesn't provide a simple structured model. There's too much boilerplate to consume them from the client perspective. 
And it can also be very cumbersome to even consume these microservices from back-end environments, like in the code behind in your website or your API. And it can be difficult to test APIs effectively and efficiently. So we consider that the API services uh, as consumers to remoting microservices. And in general, whenever possible, you should prefer an interface-based programming model. Now, a little additional detail on remoting interfaces. All the operations must be task-based. And that's, that's a requirement that stands across the board with the uh, programming models and communications approaches that are built into the fabric. In addition, the service, the service contracts must inherit from the iService marker interface. And it's important to note for those of you coming from WCF that the interfaces in the service fabric are not service contracts. All the parameters, in addition, must be uh, serializable by data contract serializer. And we recommend with your DTOs that even though the fabric will support, as it data contract serializer did in WCF, implicit data contracts, meaning that you don't have to explicitly apply the data contract and data member attributes, we recommend that you do follow the opt-in model because that makes it much easier uh, and more robust to control your DTOs over time. Now, it's also important to note that not only the DTOs require uh, data contract serialization, but also your state, which we'll touch on in future sessions. Now we look into the specifics of the programming model. Clients accessing remoting services use a simple, clean programming model as a service proxy factory method, create a VI. You provide the service's virtual address. And it has a signature that looks familiar, but is fundamentally different. Fabric scheme, a simple forward slash to denote that we are not, this is not an actual real address, it's a virtual address. And then you provide the application's name and the service name, as we'll see in the code. This particular uh, virtual address format allows the fabric to identify the service type within the cluster. And each is unique by application. What's going on here is really a form of discovery where the client factory resolves against the fabric to, to obtain a particular service instance's physical address. And that's all hidden from you under the covers. And you can imagine since all the services are hosted in the fabric and the fabric owns the actual instances, you need this virtual addressing mechanism so that you don't have any coupling between the abstraction of the type of service you want to access and its physical location, which is very powerful. Now, if we were to look at that code directly, we have the definition of the service proxy. We have our data contract. For those of you coming from WCF, this all looks very familiar. The difference, of course, is that the interface is purely an interface. It's no longer a service contract, no adornment of attributes. And as we discussed, it inherits from iService. And all methods are task-based. And if we look at the, uh, the simple URI, we create the URI with the appropriate virtual address scheme pass that to the factory method, get an instance of our proxy back, and make a call. It's also important to note that unlike other programming uh, communications programming frameworks, the Fabric's client environment automatically takes care of closing down the proxy, so you don't have to do a close anymore, which even makes the programming model that much more succinct. Now, as we discussed in the first session, state is fundamental um, to the service fabrics programming model. So you always have to consider it. Now, in the case of stateless services, of course, there is no explicit state managed by the service fabric. And this is the most common usage pattern. There are also stateful services, and they provide explicit state that the service fabric manages. However, 
that programming model is more complicated than the simple straightforward programming model um, that we've seen so far for stateless remoting services. And it's largely relegated to advanced scenarios. Stateful services are, of course, very powerful, but at the same time, you have to allow your developer community to first get comfortable with the basics of the programming model before you introduce more advanced uh, concepts that come along with um, creating and, and managing stateful services. And we'll touch on stateful services in a future uh, webcast. Now, if we look specifically at the service programming model for stateless remoting service, it inherits from a simple base, implements the contract, and that's it. Now, this is the type of programming model that you want uh, for your dev community of a broad spectrum of acumen. Or to quote Yuval, of course, this is the type of programming model that you want from now until the end of time. This is nice and structured, simple, straightforward, does support multiple interfaces if you need, and uh, it's highly testable, of course. And of course, anything with the interface-based programming model just automatically supports or promotes uh, solid principles. Now, detail about the service programming model is that the services are required to create and define uh, what type of connectivity they support explicitly. And they do this through a listener for each type of interaction that they support. Within the base, there is a creation method called create communication listeners that returns a collection of service instance listeners, which is a wrapper for the actual specific type of listener for the communications that your service supports. For remoting services, they use the built-in fabric transport listener, aptly named fabric transport service remoting listener. And it is the, def the default transport for remoting for both services and for actors within the fabric. And this little snippet just shows the implementation of the creation method where the service instance listener provides a factory method to create the listener and wraps it. And this is done, actually, this operation is also done in the context of the service bootstrap and startup process. So it's in line with the fabrics architecture and uh, operational um, life cycle. And it's very important because uh, some early adopters have tried to create communications uh, interactions outside of the listener um, structure. And they've had some problems as the fabric starts to move things around or even starting up their services because it's not in line with the actual workflow and the operational aspects and the events uh, involved with the fabric starting up a service. Now, one last note, since the, ser the service fabric owns the hosting, you must register your services with the fabric uh, at the time of startup of your host. And that means that you have to create uh, a concept called the fabric runtime, and it is the fabric's administrative and diagnostics interface to your service. Since it has to maintain uh, information about your service and provide health in, uh, aspects and other things and be able to allow the fabric to control your host, you have to keep the instance of the fabric runtime in memory. So when you're hosting in the fabric, that means that once you have registered your services, uh, that are contained within that given host process, then you must put that host to sleep. Now this code snippet shows a helper that encapsulates the details of and the boilerplate of using Fabric Runtime. And the Fabric Programming Model now supports these helpers for both the service and for the actor. So you have a simple service runtime helper that allows you to do a simple and succinct registration. And you provided a type. And as you'll notice, throughout the Service Fabrics programming model, you provided um, factory methods to actually instantiate uh, different concepts. 
as we saw with the listener, so too we're providing an instance uh, of our service. Now, before we jump into the demo, we have to talk briefly about the hosting specifics of Service Model EX Service Fabric. By design, hosting for this for Service Model EX Service Fabric was done for simplicity. So by default, hosts the services in process to your client process. And the idea there was to simplify and eliminate any hosting burden of um, your, your services in your existing environments. It also targets the most common uh, preparation story of carving up your monolithic website or API in place without adding any additional operational burden. Now, Service Model EX Service Fabric can support hosting services out of PROC, but only goes as far as local host. And the point there being, of course, is that we're not rebuilding the service fabric. Uh, to do that, to go any further, would be to add in uh, more advanced concepts into the notion, which you can do if you need, but ideally we're trying to keep the operational uh, footprint uh, as you carve up your, your monolith in place uh, as small as possible. To take a look at that graphically, what we're just talking about quickly is that hosting in Azure Service Fabric, you have your cluster as a physical boundary, you have your application or, or more specifically your microservice as a logical boundary that, that organizes one or more services, and then each service in the Azure Service Fabric is hosted in its own process boundary. With Service Model EX Service Fabric, again, to reduce the footprint, we are hosting the services and the logical microservice within a given client process by default. And so that allows then you to carve up a variety of different things as well as host Service Model EX Service Fabric in a variety of different environments. Could be your website, API, uh, a different type of executable, some type of mo mobile process, or hopefully in the future, even an IoT device. And lastly, the canonical model for this, of course, is uh, working within the context of a web server process uh, and behind your controller, taking the code out of your controller and starting to provide well-structured microservice code behind that that's compatible with the fabric. All right. On to the demo. So what we're going to look at quickly is we're going to take a look at a stateless remoting service. We're going to highlight the, the easy transfer story, starting in .NET, transferring to the service fabric, and then show that we can move between. And then if we have time, uh, we'll have to see if we can do this. But we get through the demo, we'll go back into the .NET environment and look at some of the more advanced capabilities that, uh, of unit testing that we can do in that environment that are beyond what the uh, Azure Service Fabric provides today. So I'm going to quickly switch over into my uh, work environment. Okay, and where we're at right now is that we're looking at Hello World example that you can download from the iDesign website for Service Model EX Service Fabric. So this is purely in .NET. If we look at the solution layout, it has what you would expect. We have our interfaces uh, differentiated out so that we can deploy them both to the client and to the service. And if we look at the references, you'll note that there are no references to the Azure Service Fabric libraries uh, on this side. Take a look at the interface directly. It abides by the remoting service programming model. The only additional Thing that you'll notice because Service Model EX Service Fabric is built on top of WCF. We are using the, we still have to apply uh, the service contract ideas here. However, they are not required when we move to Azure Service Fabric. However, they don't produce any uh, negative side effects. So as we move between the two, um, it's not a problem to leave them in place. And you notice we also have our service, our simple integration tests, and then we also have, of course, Service Model EX Service Fabric. 
has all the requisite um, compatibility aspects supporting both actors and services for programming model within .NET. Now, if we take a look at the service specifically, you'll notice the client test harness is actually in the service project. And as we discussed, that's done for simplicity. Since the service shares a process with the client, instead of introducing anything more in these introductory uh, examples, we just host the client code within the same service process for now. You'll notice when we move over to Azure Service Fabric, we will differentiate um, between those because we will actually be hosting the service in the fabric itself. When we look at the host, very straightforward. We have our registration with our simple registration uh, factory method. And there's a little bit of extra code here to differentiate between the two that in when we're in the context of service model EX service fabric in .NET that we run the client code and then as we always would in a console, it just pause it. However, when we're in Azure service fabric, we would put our host to sleep. We take a look at the service programming model. Again, nice and tight and straightforward. It's important to note that within the programming of the service itself, there is no conditional compilation towards uh, the service fabric, uh, service model EX service fabric. So that keeps the programming model uh, in the areas where the devs are actually working nice and clean. The only additional uh, aspect that we have was we wanted to provide the same kind of validation for the service uh, addresses in Service Model EX Service Fabric as the, the actual Azure Service Fabric will do. So instead of modeling the actual manifest design in XML, we chose instead to create a simple attribute that we apply to our services that produce the application name and service name so that you can ensure that the addresses that you're creating for your client will actually coincide correctly with those uh, with the services once you move from .NET into the actual fabric itself. The other thing of note is that here is the fully expressed uh, creation of the listener, the fabric transport remoting listener. And there's an additional detail to here that we'll touch on in future sessions we are establishing a convention for naming, leveraging the endpoints or uh, interfaces name for both the endpoint name as well as the listener name. And we'll touch on those more detail in future sessions. Other than that, the programming model is nice and tight and we have our task-based operation. It's important to note that we're not applying async and await here because this particular method currently is not asynchronous. So that allows you uh, to denote as a best practice to only apply async and await in the scenarios where your service operations are actually async. Leave them traditional using the, the from result to return a result in the cases where async and uh, where, where the, your operation is not asynchronous. And so if we were going to run this quickly, it hosts in the same process, both the client and the service. And we have our simple little hello world result. Now, if we take a look at the client really quickly, it shows a very simple uh, test harness structure where we have a public uh, access to run our tests. And then within the harness, we have one or more uh, integration tests named using the scheme that you're comfortable with. It shows the simple addressing scheme. And again, we apply the application manifest attribute 
so that we can actually validate that your uh, address is correct from the client perspective so that when you move into the Azure Service Fabric, you won't have any surprises. We have the simple create, and the only additional detail here is that we are actually uh, assigning the listener name, and this is just a convention that we use so that as we move forward uh, in advanced usages uh, of remoting services, we'll uh, be able to support multiple endpoints. Other than that, the code is very straightforward and simple. Now we move over to the solution targeting the Azure Service Fabric. We'll see a couple different things. You'll notice that the, the client is now differentiated. You'll notice that we are now uh, targeting the fabric. So we have the fabric related libraries. You also notice that the client code, in addition to having the C-sharp insignia also has this little blue box. What that means effectively is that this file is linked to the files that are actually maintained currently in the Service Model EX Service Fabric solution. So if we were to take a look at what's on disk, we would note that there are no files, no C-sharp files actually in the Azure Service Fabric solution they are maintained with the Service Model EX Service Fabric solution. And that allows this very simple bi-directional programming flow from one side to the other so that if we were to come in and change our, our harness call and say we just change this first one to say my, save it off, and we go back into the other environment, of course it's going to detect it and automatically change it. And so this makes it very simple as you're leveraging this particular strategy to move back and forth between without having to copy files and those kind of things. Other than that, the code's identical. The interface as well is linked, and that code is all the same. Nothing new here. We look into the, the service. The code for the service and the host are also linked simple transfer story between what you notice we have a new folder here uh, as a package and that's an aspect of the service fabric that allows you to define a package for the service both its configuration which includes settings and this is the type of things you would put normally in app settings but now you would put them in the settings xml for your service if you wanted to convey configuration values to your service as well as, as its manifest. We won't dwell on this too much, but this is where we define that we have a stateless service. What type of host we're going to use for the code package. And the code package is essentially everything that you would put in a folder to allow this particular process to operate correctly. And the fabric does all of that automatically on your behalf, building the package as well as we're just defining the endpoint using our naming convention of the actual interface. The newest aspect is this notion of an application. It is a new type of project specific to Service Fabric that delineates the services within this application. We've discussed also that depending on the way that you're going to deploy to the fabric, the application um, name may be somewhat of a misnomer and that for a federated shared collection of microservices, it might more represent the, your, the collection of services in a iDesign method uh, informed architecture that would represent your microservice or your subsystem. There are a variety of other parameters that uh, are advanced. You can have different publishing profiles that can keep the uh, security aspects relative to each platform that you're um, deploying to, as well as additional application parameters at the application level, and the scripts for actually executing deployment. The most interesting thing, though, is the application manifest. 
just like the service manifest for the service itself, defining specific aspects of the hosting as well as the endpoints for your service. The application manifest brings all the services together, defines what packages are involved in this application, and then also is the point where you defined your scalability as well as your reliability in the case of stateful services. And in this case, we have a stateless service. We are denoting that the instance count is going to be minus one. And minus one, in this case, tells the fabric to deploy the service to every single node. If we were to publish this, you'll see that the publishing is, is really powerful, where from the same interface within service uh, Visual Studio, you can publish via the appropriate profile to any of your environments. In this case, we're going to deploy to my uh, one box development environment. And it walks through the whole entire deployment cycle of building, creating the project, uh, the package, excuse me, publishing into the fabric, removing the old instance in the case of development, which you can control, and then standing it up. And now, instead of running the service, of course, because now the service is actually running in the fabric, we can just run the client and interface with our service. And it's important to note that this is the exact same code, exact same behavior that we observed in .NET, now running in the one box development environment of the service fabric. And that's the same kind of experience you would have if you were deploying into the on-prem fabric or into Azure itself. So this is a powerful way of being able to expedite your preparation by starting simply and succinctly in .NET very quickly and then moving uh, the code back and forth between both environments. All right, I'm going to switch back to the presentation quickly. So the there was a question on uh, OneBox. Uh, OneBox is what Microsoft calls the developer um, deployment of the service fabric, meaning that it can simulate, as you saw in the demo, five nodes on a single box. And so they call that the OneBox uh, development environment. All right, briefly, and then we'll get into some more questions. We're excited to announce the next part uh, in the webcast series will be, now that we know a little bit about the programming model, we will actually look at the method in the fabric, how we can leverage the iDesign method to stay compatible with the system structure. We can codify the implementation using modern uh, software construction techniques, also promote microservice autonomy and encourage reuse. And just so you know, you can find any of the previous recorded sessions on YouTube uh, by looking up iDesign Inc. TV. We also have to mention again that we have the brand new Service Fabric Masterclass. First one's already sold out. Um, Beth did mention that there is one single spot left for anyone who, the first one who emails her. The second one is almost sold out, so we encourage you to act fast. And this, I'm excited, very excited to actually teach this class. The goal of this class is to deeply immerse you into the platform. Numerous hands-on labs, dozens of examples. Uh, by the time you're finished, you will have feel very comfortable in the service fabric environment. For those of you who want to learn more about microservice design, refine and deepen your understanding, we encourage you to uh, check out the architect master's class as well as the architecture clinic, both of which focus on the iDesign, your mastery of the iDesign method, as well as uh, what it means to become a modern architect. So if you want to deepen your understanding of microservices, we encourage you to look at those. And then of course, finally, we have the resources Service Model EX, 
Service Model EX Service Fabric, which you've seen uh, in this session. There's also, uh, we will soon be providing Service Fabric EX, which brings some additional uh, capabilities to the Fabric programming model itself. And you can find all these at idesign.net downloads. So at that point, I appreciate you, your uh, attention.